from the 42nd chapter of the book of Isaiah, verses 1 through 4, the 17th chapter of the book of St. John, verses 1 through 5, and verses 19 through 22, and from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Hear the words of the Lord from Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench until he has brought forth justice unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has set justice in the earth, and the owls shall wait for his law. St. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, verses 19 through 22. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven, saying, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one. Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me and the glory that you have given me. I have given them that they may be one as we are one. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of humankind. He humbled himself, being found in human fashion, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us reason together from this subject, the glory of servant leadership. The glory of servant leadership. Will you repeat that after me? The glory of servant leadership. Thanks be to God for this ecclesiastical year in which the Lord 
has inspired us with the theme, Servant Leadership, the Kingdom Standard for Ministry. We are in the final few days of this ecclesiastical year. As there are 10 days remaining in this ecclesiastical year, the Lord has blessed us even in the midst of great challenges to rise up to meet each situation that we face. For servant leadership, that term being coined by Robert K. Greenleaf in the book that he authored which champions a radical shift in the nature of relating to people from a position of authority. Greenleaf codifies it and applies it to individuals in corporations, business establishments, schools, as well as governments. But it is obvious that Greenleaf gets his inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. For whoever it is that engages in the work of the kingdom, God refers to them and claims them as his servant. Even Abraham, who was the father of the faithful, God called his servants. His descendants, Isaac and Jacob, God called his servants. The one that God used to establish the law, God called my servant Moses. In the passages of scripture that we have read this morning, we find the prophet Isaiah with his messianic focus and eagle eye vision, giving great credence to the role of Jesus Christ within the unconventional role of servant leader. Most leaders are obnoxious individuals surrounded by people that are chosen because many leaders are so insecure that they need yes people around them. They do not want to be enlightened or challenged or questioned or even given information. They want somebody to keep telling them that they are right. The last century saw these kinds of persons in leadership position flooding the stage of the political arena, taking nations down the drain with them. How can we ever forget individuals such as Kaiser Wilhelm, who precipitates the First World War? How can we ever forget Hirohito, Mussolini, Hitler, strong leaders, but strangely insecure and narcissistic? They could not stand even the advice of generals telling them you are headed for defeat and self-destruction because they believed that they should have been elevated upon pedestals to look down their noses at others. Some people seek positions of leadership because they want to manipulate and control people. The Bible reminds us that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But God warns about nations who have wicked and unjust leaders. Even now in America, we as well as the world see that we are still trying to shake off the vestiges from a leader who is so stuck on being in power that no lie is too vicious for him to tell. But that is not the issue. The issue is that there are people that don't want real leadership. The 
Bible speaks of God sending this great leader into the world, Jesus Christ. But when God sends him, his own people don't even want him. He comes to his own. His own family doesn't accept him. His own nation rejects him. The Roman realm sentenced him to execution. Every person who is a part of our team of servant leaders, whether it is in auxiliaries or ministries or whatever capacity, you know that the moment that you made up your mind to serve God, that the enemy has taken direct aim at you. You were doing fine as long as you were sitting somewhere in a corner, a face lost in the crowd. Nobody knew your name. You didn't want to get involved, and you didn't want to be active. And it seems as though you are getting away with a lifestyle that is undisturbed. But the fact of the matter is, God has never called anybody to sit quietly on a pew and do nothing. He has called us to roll up our sleeves and to do the work of ministry. Jesus gives us that standard by saying, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no one can work. For the word of God teaches us we are workers together with him. Now, if you're going to work with Jesus, you have to adopt Jesus' attitude. That's what the writer says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Since you're working with Jesus, then if you had a bad attitude before, you need to check your baggage at the altar. I know a lot of people don't come to the baggage checkout counter, but we have a wall-to-wall -wall baggage checkout counter in this church. It is highlighted in red because of its Judeo-Christian connection. Altars have always been a killing place. It has been the place of sacrifice, the place where blood flows. And whenever we come to the altar, it is obvious that it's a killing place because if you kneel at it, even your knees would tell you, yes, this is a killing place. If you bow down at the altar, it becomes obvious that you engage in a struggle that you might call self to be denied and Christ to reign supreme in your life. Because if you're going to run this race, you can't run it carrying suitcases and boxes and chairs and furniture and egos. If you're going to run this race, as the classic Olympics demonstrated to us, you really have to strip down. <laughs> Even in modern Olympics, we find that runners have very scarce clothing, but you know that originally the Olympics in Greece, it was men only, men athletes, men spectators. And one of the reasons for that was the runners in the race knew that if you're going to run the race, you don't carry anything with you or on you. And that is what Paul had in mind when he said, let us lay aside every weight, everything, every accessory, everything that attaches itself to you so that as you run the race, you run it with perseverance because it is not a dash. It is a marathon. You don't run till you get mad or upset or disillusioned. You run the race until God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been consistent and faithful in a few things. Now it's time for me to show you that there's glory in servant leadership. Notice these words of the prophet Isaiah. For God sanctions the one that he is called by saying, use him as an example. Look at him, study him, behold my servant. I'm 
and the one who has called him and the one who's holding him up. And because he is the chosen, my soul delights in him. I have poured my spirit out upon him for the purpose of bringing forth justice unto the nations. The church is the place where justice begins. The record is justice begins in the house of God. I know that you may have used other versions that say judgment begins in the house of God, but the purpose of judgment should be justice. The reason why there is judgment is because the person who is entrusted with this position ought to be impartial. Just as surely as when one steps behind the sacred Desk. It is true when one sits at the bench, you have no enemies to punish, no friends to reward. You are about the impartial and equity treatment of all of God's children. Justice then should be at home in the church. And because God's justice begins here, then that means we must be at the forefront of standing for justice in the society. It is no accident that because the church is the justice house, that churches were the first to be bombed in our struggle for human rights. How can we ever forget the reason why Birmingham, Alabama was called Bombingham, Alabama? Because the 16th Street Church in Birmingham during the Sunday school hour was attacked by vicious terrorists. And they didn't attack bars. They didn't attack the SCLC office. They did not attack the NAACP office. They came for the church before there was an SCLC, before there was an NAACP, justice begins at the church. Jesus was and is a justice preacher. And that is why the Lord says, I have validated him, emboldened him, anointed him, and he has such a sense for justice that even those persons that have been persecuted to even within an inch of their lives. The prophet refers to them as a bruised reed. Those who have been dared to dream again, those who have been challenged, you don't have a right to hope. Even in our black national anthem, it is phrased on this wise, when hope unborn had died. You understand, that's Abortion. And we've been dealing with abortion for 300 and 403 years in this country. We are the first ones who were subject to abortion. And that is why it is written in our national anthem, when hope unborn had died. We would dare to even hope in the first place, but if you dare to hope, if you dare to believe in freedom, if you dare to pray that things will get better, if you dare to even want to learn how to read, America aborted our hopes. Abortion is what they use to control us, and now they have flipped the switch and say that they are the ones who are in favor of life. We are more pro-life than any radical right-wing extremist. How can you be pro-life and anti-vaccination? Pro-life and anti-mask? Pro-life and anti poverty people. They hate poor people and strive to keep them poor, cut programs that help the poor, yet they say they are pro-life. They hate early childhood development and education, have cut food stamps, have cut programs that assist 
mothers who are trying to raise children by themselves, yet they lie and say we are pro-life. They are certainly not pro-law enforcement. You can't be pro-cop and pro-coup at the same time. Obviously, we live in a place where mixed messages have been sent from people who claim to know God. The issue has never been, are you a racist? No, the issue is, are you anti-racist? What are you doing to dismantle the infrastructure of racism that is built into the consciousness, legal system, as well as social structure of this country? And you don't do that unless you are trained to do so. Obviously, when Jesus comes to stand for justice, he realizes he's a marked man. He came here ready to die. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world to bear witness to the truth. And because of that commitment of Jesus Christ, we find ourselves marked by Christ, by his cross, of commitment to the kingdom. Amen. An individual cannot truly follow Jesus without developing a relationship with the cross of Christ. That is why this commitment to Jesus Christ sets us apart from the world. It's not the notion of you being a member of a large congregation or so-called mega church. There are too many mega church members who do many ministry work. It's not about mega churches. It's about mega faith, mega witness, mega love, mega outreach. You got to touch somebody with your love for Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is is the suffering savior. He's the one who gives his life. He's the one that confronts the enemy. He doesn't send people into battle. He goes into battle himself. Look at Jesus about to go into battle telling those who arrested him, don't bother my disciple. This is you and me. Don't bother Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Matthew, no, they're not ready for this. They are not called to do this. I'm the one you want. And even when they came to arrest Jesus and he looked at the soldiers and said, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And when he said, I am he, they fell to the ground. Jesus demonstrated his kingdom authority by giving them permission to get back on their feet in order to arrest him. That is why he said to Pilate, you can't do anything to me unless my father allows you to do it. Yes, Jesus heads the fight, leads the charge. He doesn't send folk into battle. He goes into battle himself. Even the psalmist said that about him. He didn't say, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He knew he had to tread the wine press alone. He knew disciples weren't going in there with him. How you gonna take disciples with you when one of them is gonna say, I never even met you. You know I ain't going into no valley of the shadow of death with you. Another sold him out for $19.20. Another said, except I see the hole in his side, the holes in his hands, I won't even believe that he's the risen Christ. Some things you got to do by yourself. Don't expect everybody to pat you on the back and tell you how wonderful you are when God called you, God chose you, God anointed you. Some things come down to your commitment for Christ. You may not be able to say amen to that. Just say, hmm. Yes, servant leadership is sacrifice. It is self-denial. It is focus and commitment, mental and spiritual concentration. But it is also glory. And a lot of people don't stick around long enough for the glory. 
Glory doesn't come overnight. Glory doesn't come the first time you get knocked down. Glory doesn't come the first time you're disappointed or your heart is broken. In order for you to be glorified, you got to stay there through thick and thin. Stay there through the storms that keep on coming. Stay there even when friends leave you alone. But if you endure to the end, if you wait on the Lord, you got some glory coming. I wish I had some help up, and I know it's a little heavy. That's why God has to condition you. God's got to work with you. God's got to put his word in you, put it so deep in you that he plants it between your soul and spirit. He puts it between the joints and marrow of your bone. God's got to prepare you for the challenges of serving him. But if you can't take it, you can't make it. If you don't fast, you won't last. If you don't pray, you won't stay. But if God will give you grace to stay with it, you got some glory coming. Come on, somebody, help me give God some praise. Why don't you look at somebody and tell them if you stay with it, you got some glory coming. You see, you have to be stronger than your enemies. That's why God calls you overcomers. To overcome something or someone means you got to be stronger, better than what you're coming against. God always gives you the edge. He taught you how to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He has taught you how to mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. You got the edge because you have the almighty God fighting for you. You got the edge because prayer changes things. You got the edge because out of your belly flows rivers of living water. You got the edge because you got the word of God in you. His word has made you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You have everything you need to overcome. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Get rid of excuses. Get rid of a spirit of anxiety, worry, and self-destruction. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You are designed to go all the way. You are not a quitter. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. You are not a quitter. You are a winner. Let me hear if I got some winners up in here today. Let me hear if I'm a winner. Now, let me tell you something about winning in God's kingdom. You see, the rest of the world has strange rules for winning. The Bible even discusses it by saying in the world, only one can win the race. Even in the Boston Marathon, one wins. New York Marathon, one wins. Even in Philadelphia, Broad Street is crowded, but one wins. In the 500, one wins, but not so with God. I'm glad that God says it's not about you being the fastest runner. Remember, you are not a competitor, you are a servant. Competitors mean I got to outdress somebody. I got to outperform somebody. I got to outsing. I got to outshine. So I got to outdo. No, that's competition. Serving is one thing. Competing is another. I'm not competing with any preacher, any pastor. I got a battle to fight. I got a victory to win, a charge to keep our hand. A God to glorify, never dying soul to save, fitted for the sky. You don't have to try to be a carbon copy of somebody else to try to compete with them and outdo them. You can be yourself and win. You can be true to yourself and win. You can develop your own identity and win. 
This is a different kind of race. In other races, you got to try to figure out that if I'm not faster than others, I better try to knock them out. I better try to take advantage of them. I better do some damage. I better do something sneaky to the machines so I can get the most votes. But in God's kingdom, you ain't got to hate nobody to win. You don't have to spread lies and kill people's reputation to win. All you got to do is be faithful unto death. I'm going to give you a crown of life. Even if you can't preach like Paul, you got a crown coming. Can't sing like an angel. But whatever I sing is going to be to the glory of God. Come on, help me give God some praise here today. Yes, I am a winner. But I'm a winner not because... I engaged in dirty politics. If, God, I, if I have to kill your influence to win, it's not worth it to me. If I have to lie on you to win, if I have to take skeletons out of your closet to win, it's not worth it to me because I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'm not stuck on position. I got a position. It's called servant. And if I'm faithful as a servant, I have some glory coming. And that's the reason why the saying is true. You really don't know my glory unless you know my story. Every real servant has a story to tell. Anybody that God has exalted, anybody that God has planted and established, you have a testimony. No wonder the Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the words of their testimony. A servant of Jesus should not be ashamed of where the Lord has brought you from. Remember, God will elevate you. God will take you up. But when God elevates you, don't act like you just like everybody else. No, it took something different for me to get here. It took a different trajectory, took a different path in order for me to make it. And that's why I can't join the clique, because it was never meant for me to be a member of the clique. Where was the clique when I was on 12th Street in Louisville, Kentucky, with mismatched chairs across the street from a beer tavern. But the, the glory of God showed up. And when the glory shows up, you don't have to explain or apologize for what you don't have. We learned that we could shout with mismatched chairs. We learned that we could dance on sawdust. We learned that we could be happy. And the place where we went shopping was the secondhand store, the Goodwill, the thrift store. And then there are people that are in cathedrals, on cushioned pews, stained glass windows, pipe organ chandeliers, wall-to-wall -wall carpet, and can't even lift their hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Can't even clap their hands and give God glory. I'd rather have Jesus than the fashion of the world. You can have the click. You can have the crowd. You can have the buddyhood because servants have never been popular with the crowd. Servants have to learn how to smile when you feel like crying. servants have to learn how to lean and depend on Jesus. Servant 
hearts have to trust him. For the song says, if you trust him and never doubt, he'll surely bring you out. And when you get burdened, take them to the checkout counter. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Take your problems to the Lord, leave them there. Your pains, your hurts, your wounds, your disappointments, go to the checkout counter. Oh, Lord. Look at somebody and ask them, have you been to the checkout counter lately? How long has it been? Since you've been to the baggage check and say, Lord, I, I'm tired of carrying all this around, carrying grudges around, carrying guilt around, carrying jealousy around, carrying envy and strife, still fighting the same fight that you had 15 years ago. Come to the checkout counter, the baggage counter, say, Lord, I'm tired of poison in my system. I'm tired of hatred. I'm tired of being small-minded. I want to grow. I want to develop. I want to rise. I want to run this race. I'm ready to lay it aside. Oh, Lord, I know I got some glory coming. Jesus pray to the Father. I'm getting ready to go into battle. Nobody's going with me. Oh, Lord, the disciples can't come with me. I told them where I'm going, you cannot come. And this is the strange thing, Father. Father, you're not even coming with me because I got to shred the wine press alone. In fact, not only did the Father not go with Jesus, the Father wouldn't even look at Jesus. He turned his head. Why did he do that? Because Jesus became sin. Jesus became the curse. Jesus became the object of God's anger. The Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to strike him. It pleased the Lord to oppress him, to abuse him, because he became the thing God hated. And God couldn't even look at him. God turned his back. And when God turned away, the sun wouldn't even look at him. It got dark from the sixth to the ninth hour. Judgment was poured out on Jesus. Death, destruction was poured out on Jesus. Look at him now. The enemies are saying, I told you he wasn't nothing. His disciples had run away. There he is all alone, crying in the darkness, my God, my God, why? I never hurt anybody, never lied on anybody, never took advantage of anybody. Why won't you look at me? Why won't you let the sun shine on me? Why am I so lonely? Why have you forsaken me? But Jesus stayed with it. Oh, Lord, I'm alone, but I'm going to stay with it. My eyes are bloodstained, but I'm going to stay with it. I've lost my shape. Bones are out of point. I can't hardly breathe, but I'm going to stay with it. Thorns in my brow, nails in my feet, but I'm going to stay with it. When you're hurt, stay with it. When you're talked about, stay with it. When you're missing understood stay with it oh yes stay with it when tears are in your eyes stay with it when the burdens are heavy stay with it when the pains are unbearable stay with it you got some glory coming say yes say yes I said you got some glory Jesus, 
when you gonna get some glory, Jesus? James and John wanted to know, Jesus, when your glory coming? Because when you get some glory, I want to sit next to you. I want to be on your right side and your left side, but I'm not going to bother you now because you're on Calvary's cross. You're on a hill far away. I'm not with you as long as you're hurting, as long as you're sick, as long as you are tempted, as long as you are tried, as long as you're in the fire, as long as God is punishing you for the sins of the whole world. I'm not going to bother you, but, but when you're going to get some glory, because when you get elected, when you get appointed, when you get your position, then I want to be your friend. In fact, when you get elevated, save a seat for me. Even my mama said, put John on one side put James on the other but for some strange reason the glory didn't show up while he was on the cross the glory didn't show up while he was walking the waters filling the tempest casting out demons I'm going to wait on the Lord because I know it's coming I may not understand it I may not feel like shouting but I know it's coming I got to wait on God I got to keep on serving keep on pressing my way I I know it's coming. She died and didn't have no glory. Oh Lord, I said, Jesus died and had no glory, no eulogy, no obituary, no flowers, no roses. Jesus died and had no glory. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, it is sown in dishonor, but is raised in honor. It is sown in weakness, but raised in strength. Sown corruptible, but raised incorruptible. What Jesus was saying, I don't need no glory right now. I gotta suffer first. I gotta hurt first. I gotta die first. I gotta go to hell first. God, meet me in hell. Meet me while I'm preaching a three day revival in hell. Go, Jesus. Preach to demons. Preach to generations past. Preach to Noah. Preach to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Preach to Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Jesus, preach to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. Preach to the dead. I'm going to glorify you. When you get in hell, when you get in the pit, I'm going to give you some glory. Jesus, body messed up, but I got glory in hell ain't got no disciples ain't got nobody to preach a resurrection Sunday morning but the glory is mine I'd rather have the glory look at Jesus Pontius Pilate had the governor's seat but Jesus had the glory Caesar had the emperor's seat but Jesus had the glory. The high priest was elected to be in charge of the temple, but he didn't have no glory. It's worth it to go through the process, go through the suffering, go through the pain to get your glory. Stay with it, Jesus, all night, Friday night, all day, Saturday, all night. Saturday night, your tomb is sealed. Your disciples are discouraged, and the devil is throwing a party. The devil said, I got him. Death, you sure you got him? Grave, you sure you can hold him? But they didn't know when glory 
can't break out. Death got to get back when glory breaks out. Grave got to give you up when glory breaks out. Hell got to spit you out. Jesus said the glory has come early on the first day morning. The glory showed up. Jesus led a parade out of hell. He led captivity captive, gave gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Go ahead, Jesus. You look better than you've ever looked in your life. Your hair is beautiful. Your eyes are radiant. Your face is brilliant. Jesus, you got the glory. You suffered. You died. You went through it. You got the glory. You didn't buy it. You didn't rub it on. You didn't spray it on. You didn't paint it on. But it's glory straight from God. Glory is in your belly. It's in your spirit. It's in your attitude. It's in your hands. It's in your feet. Glory. Mm. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to bow down at your feet and give you glory. I just want to worship you. You alone are worthy to be exalted. God has highly exalted him. Look at Jesus. God has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. You got it, Jesus. You got the glory. Come on, help me praise him. Jesus, you got it. You deserve it. Jesus, thank you for the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the glory. I feel healing virtue in this place. I feel the anointing. I feel the joy of the Lord. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Anybody here feel it? I feel it like fire in my palm. I feel it. The glory of the Lord is in this place. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Come on, help me glorify him. Come on and help me praise him. Come on, help me lift him up. The glory of the Lord is in this place. Stay with it. He'll lift you up. Stay with it. He'll bring you out. Stay with it. He'll make your enemies be your footstool. Stay with it. He'll make you the head and not the tail. Stay with it. Say yes. Say yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody help me say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Oh, yes. I feel glory. I feel mercy. I feel his grace. I feel his power. I feel his arms of protection. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Open the windows of heaven. Pour it out. Pour it out. I need it. Pour it out. I want it. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. We need your glory. We need your power. We need your spirit. Pour it out. Thank you. Oh, oh yes. Pour it out. Pour it out. Hallelujah.
Oh, Lord. Somebody lift your hands and say, pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out on me. Let my cup run over. Pour it out. 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 Oh. oh, Lord. Pour it out. I wish I had time. Praise him like I feel it. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Pour it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.